This vlog is a visual representation of the reasoning and coaching process that I've used with two different athletes with either a capacity or a skill based limitation preventing athletic development. The key narrative in this video is twofold. Firstly, that false expression as will be displayed by the first athlete is a skill. The addition of external load for an athlete with low task experience can cause maladaptation to a movement strategy because the neuromuscular system may deem this to be a threat to its system. However, with the manipulation of the environmental constraints and kinesthetic correction, this can be overcome in a very short period of time through motor relearning. Secondly, that in the example of the second athlete, a capacity impairment can be improved by deconstructing the skill, providing you have an understanding of the kinetics, kinematics, primary musculature involved in the component part of the movement task. This analysis can help to optimize a secondary training transfer to the primary skill. This will be shown in the second athlete example. To facilitate the viewer's understanding of what is meant by capacity and a skill, it is worthwhile defining the differences and how this relates to athletic performance. A capacity is any biomotor attribute that is related to or aids the performance of a movement skill. It could be argued that an athlete expresses their capacities through a specific skill. This might include such biomotor activities as force production, rate of force production or for example after kinematic joint excursion. A skill is the expression of an interconnected neuromuscular activity which is controlled by and large by the central nervous system at an activity or participation level as defined by the International Classification of Function. So, for example, as will be seen in this video, the squat and the split squat are skills used to illustrate the coaching process for these athletes. The first athlete is a 28 year old recreational competitive cross country runner who has expressed a desire to improve her lower limb explosiveness. She has a very low resistance training age and has never been involved in a formal strength or power development program. So the squat is the chosen method to provide secondary training transfer to enhance her lower limb, hip and knee extensor strength for running based hill reps. This will therefore facilitate a tertiary training transfer to develop explosiveness. There is evidence to suggest that subjects with a low resistance training age experience practically meaningful improvement in lower limb explosiveness with strength training. either the hip, knee, ankle or spine which could affect the kinematic profile of the technical model. There are also factors in relation to the kinetics that could affect various stages of the technical model contributing to impaired performance. In this case the mobility restrictions are clearly not an issue as the athlete displays appropriate range of motion at the hip, knee and ankle joints in planar movement. Also, it is evident that when the combined movements are co-located into a functional range of motion, the athlete displays appropriate range of motion in the critical joints without difficulty. This is again evident during the squat when a 15 kg bar is added to the athlete. However, when 20 kg is added to the athlete's bar, it is here 
that we start to see a reduction in range of motion. It will be easy to view this reduction in range of motion as a capacity limitation because of inappropriate force production. However, the athlete displays what might be explained as kinesiophobic tendencies to this particular activity because of a lack of task experience squatting with 20 kilograms. In essence, she is restricting her movement to where she feels it is safe because she has limited proprioceptive awareness, this being her first time back squatting with a 20 kilogram load. Therefore, to cue an increase in depth for the athlete, an environmental constraint is introduced using a chair and a weight plate to increase the athlete's sense of security. This also has the additional benefit of increasing her proprioceptive awareness as to when the appropriate depth is reached. This is a derivative exercise which can be progressed by lowering the height of the constraint dependent upon the athlete's rate of skill acquisition. At the end of the session, the athlete is squatting to horizontal using the chair as a proprioceptive cue. This was achieved in one training session, which provides evidence that this is a skill related impairment rather than a capacity limitation. The second case study is a recreational hockey player with a capacity limitation that displays a lack of hip abduction and unilateral core muscle strength. This prevents her from optimally expressing the split squat skill to achieve a secondary training transfer to her dysfunctional sport skill, which is a painful drag flick. This injured athlete has groin pain and posterior lateral buttock pain. In the first video, the athlete displays suboptimal movement patterns during the split squat with a unilateral load challenge and core strength during the execution of this task. The athlete displays a significant loss of spinal neutral positioning in the frontal plane and valgus collapse of the femur in the sagittal plane. Ultimate performance of this task will display control of the femur in the sagittal plane and spinal control in the frontal plane within reasonable limits. Whether or not this is deemed a skill or a capacity limitation requires judgment on the part of the practitioner. I would argue that in this situation the problem is impaired muscle force production or strength rather than a skill limitation as the athlete demonstrates reasonable performance of the skill without external load. There's not evidence of dysfunction of the force producing musculature supporting this skill when one views the athlete's inability to hold a long lever side plank. However, when the lever is shortened, the force demands reduce and the skill improves, again supporting evidence of a capacity impairment. The gluteus medius muscle isometric strength measurement on the dysfunctional side is 33% reduced compared to the contralateral side. The derivative exercises used to improve this athlete's performance in a split squat included an exercise prescription for isolated strength of the hip abductors in side line with a long lever, the side plank and also the straight plank. The hip abductors assist with the control of the femur in the sagittal plane by virtue of their combined action of hip abduction and external rotation. The side plank uses concentric muscle activity to overcome the inertia of the trunk and then isometric work to maintain spinal neutral and following that eccentric work to return to the starting position. The plank utilises a similar muscle action pattern to assist with secondary training transfer. Both trunk exercises were started in short lever positions and then progressed to long lever positions to reduce the mechanical advantage. The evidence of effect in changing capacity is seen in the improvement in performance in the split squat skill with unilateral load.